Aspetta cassata, panettoni motta, crema mantecata, ciuciù, pacchetti caramella, cazzotti in cioccolata, cartocci sfugnatella. Cristoforo Colombo non è niente pronto a me, e se scopre d'America, io già scopre da te. No! Tu non mangi broccoli, fagioli e baccalà, tu mangi arrai cardini e già gente resetà, perché quando respira io da sto vicino, sento la dura fresia. No adora Gesù mio, e tiene la bocca e fravola che amava sospirà, fravola fresca, fravola fra. Papone ciasciona, bambola di linci, tu quanto si impona. Ah ah, chiamata me pompiere, se sta picciando cora, ma pare un braciere. Chi disse pur si muove, Galilei, e sai perché? Perché forse a quell'epoca già immaginava te. No! Tu non mangi broccoli, fagioli e baccalà, tu mangi arrai cardeni e già cinta e resetà, perché quando respira io ti sto vicino, sento l'addore fresi e l'addore Gesù mio, e tieni a bocca e fravola che amava sospirà, fravola fresca, fravola fra, sotto giardini fravola, sotto giardini fravola, Fravola fresca, fravola fra. Evening, everyone. Welcome to this last event for 2021 of the Aberdeen Italian Circle. I'm delighted to be here tonight with a very special guest, Cavalier Mary Contini, OBE. But before I introduce our special guest and we can talk uh, together and uh, celebrate Christmas together, I would just like to thank you all for following us. It has been a long year. It has been a challenging year, 2021, due to COVID, but we did manage to deliver 15 online events. So thank you all for following us and for supporting us. It has been a pleasure to be with you and we are looking forward to meeting you again online and in person in 2022. I would like to thank, uh, of course, all our members and friends, uh, David Dreyer, our secretary, and all our committee members that helped us deliver all these events throughout the year. Thank you very much. But please let me introduce uh, our guest, Mary Contini, um, properly before we start our conversation. Mary Contini is the granddaughter of Italian immigrants who moved to Scotland from Piccinisco uh, in the Lazio region of Italy at the beginning of the last century. She worked in her family business from an early age before studying biological sciences at Edinburgh University. Mary has been a director of Italian Food and Wine Emporium, Valvona and Crolla in Edinburgh since 1983. Valvona and Crolla was established by her husband, Philip's grandfather, Alfonso Crolla, in 1934. In 1966, she opened the Valvona and Crolla Cafe Bar that won many accolades and prizes. In 1995, she began writing a weekly food column for the Scotsman newspaper and appeared for three years as a guest presenter for STV uh, Square Meals, promoting easy, healthy cooking um, for everyone. In 2000, she co-presented Scotland's Ladder with Catherine Brown and Derek. She's an avid campaigner to improve children's diet and encourage them to cook. So Mary, she's also the co-author of Pruirvine, uh, with Pruirvine of the best-selling children's book, um, Easy Peasy, that you can see here. I have a copy with me. 
and she also published uh, other books always for children. She continued to write and publish uh, several best-selling books. One of them is Dear Francesca that you can see here. Um, and then um, there is another one that is Dear Olivia. And the series is concluded with Dear Alphonse okay. that tells the story of Carlo Contini, Mary's father-in-law, a Napolitan who emigrated to Edinburgh after the Second World War. So, um, and to celebrate the 75th anniversary of Valvona and Crolla, she also published A Year at the Italian Table. So all these books are still available and you can buy them through the Valvona and Crolla website, but also through the major book retailers and Amazon, of course. In 2010, the Italian government conferred on Mary the honor of Cavaliere dell'Ordine della Stella della Solidarietà Italiana for her services to Italy and to Italians abroad. In October 2020, Mary was awarded an OBE in the Queen's Birthday Honors for services to the Scottish food industry and for Scottish-Italian relations. So it is a great honor to welcome Mary Contini here tonight. Thank you, Mary, for being with us. We will be in conversation with her. As usual, questions will be at the end. Please stay until the very end because we have a special surprise for you, but you need to wait and be patient. And now I pass on the virtual microphone to my colleague, David Dreyer, who is going to start with the first question. Okay, well, Mary, it's uh, it's an honour to have you talking to our circle tonight, and, and uh, it's a chance for us to learn a bit more about your family history and your traditions. When we when we hear the names Mary and Philip Contini, many people, particularly I think in Scotland, that they know that we're talking about Valvona and Crawler. It's um, it's a bit of an institution in Edinburgh and Scotland. Um, it's recognized as Scotland's oldest Italian delicatessen and wine merchant. Many uh, of the people on here tonight will probably have visited the shop, but just bear in mind that um, our audience isn't all from Scotland, so there may be some who are not familiar. So we, uh, we need to keep them engaged as well. Um, of course, people will know it if they haven't been to the shop. If you read Alexander McCall Smith's novels, you'll be very familiar with the shop. It does crop up from time to time. Really, I think what we want to do is we want to go back in time a little bit now. So could you tell us uh, a little bit about your husband Philip's grandfather, Alfonso, who Sandra mentioned in the, the third of the books. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about him, how he came to emigrate to, to Edinburgh and what led to the opening of the shop in 1934. Okay, that's that's a short story. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me and for all those things that you're saying, but particularly about the shop, because the shop for us is, is really part of our whole being, uh, especially Philip, you know, it's his grandfather's shop. But when I married Philip, my father said to me, be careful, you'll end up behind the counter. And he wasn't pleased with that idea, but actually, I've been very, there's so much richness in those small, um, those small, that small shop that you learn so much being there. Alfonso Crowler was a shepherd, a um, very poor family in the village called Fontetone, which is between Roman hills, but very, very high in the mountains, one of the highest villages. And it literally had two strings of, of um, houses, almost like a Scottish village that's stuck up now. With, and it actually just very much like what's happening in some of the villages just now, because they have no electricity, no running water. They had very, very hard winters and very beautiful summers because up in the mountains it's very cool, it's very bright. But basically to survive in the summer was fine. They had sheep and they could make uh, milk. They used to make pecorino, they used to make regatta. And then they used to trade, um, with, funny enough, with people from the north of Scotland. And they used to take tomatoes into pecorino and change it for well, which was salt cod, which came from the north of Scotland. So the links were, were there all the time. But the reason that they left just before the First World War was basically for poverty. 
um, the Italian government changed the law so that you couldn't hand over a whole property to divide it up in, in, with all the children. So because of that, a lot of the children had to leave. So Alfonso was one of the first to leave. And he, he actually, the, he did actually walk. It sounds like it's not true, but it, he actually walked from uh, Pijanisco, went down to the coast and then up to, up to Paris and then came across to Cali. And I talked to my uncle, who was still alive when I was writing. I had the privilege of hearing lots of stories of how it all happened. But it was a change, a chain migration in those days. And a lot of Italians were leaving that area of Italy from Pigeonese further down the mountain. And also from Barca, from the north of Italy, from the two main immigration into Scotland at that time. And what they did was, you know, if you look at what's happening now with immigration, it was the young, strong men. So I 2021 when he walked with his cousin and they walked and then what they would do was meet some people here there was maybe three or four Italians that were already in Scotland but that was his link and um, they, they passed through London because by then there's a lot of Italians in London a lot I'm talking about maybe 10 or 12 families we talk about 100 years ago and what they did was they would settle trade and and you know they did have things like barrel and it did sharpen knives. So all the cliches that we hear about Italian immigration is actually true in our families. Um, but what they did was then send money back for their wives and for their, their other brothers and cousins. So Alfonso actually sent money back to get um, Philip's grandmother to come across. She was 19 and she had one child. And he also sent money for my grandfather to come across, who's called Cesario de Chacro. And funny enough, the immigration, they were sort of second or third cousins. And he got Chisidio to come across. And also my grandmother, who came across in 1919, um, and had my father in his arms six months old. So that was the first immigration wave into, into Edinburgh. And people ask, why did they stop in Edinburgh? And basically what they did was they stopped in the major cities. And then the next group would stop in the next city. So... They, they, the crawlers stopped in Edinburgh. Some of them tried to go to America. Some of them went up north. Some of them ended up in Aberdeen. Some of them ended up, you know, there's a chain. There's a, there's a, a thing that my husband says, a little Italy in every high street. And what they would do was bring somebody across, let them set up. And they didn't couldn't open shops to start with. They would rent shops and start to trade. And they used to, um, you know, all the classics, they used to make fish and chips. Basically, because they knew how to fry things, they didn't have ovens at home. They, you know, they used to fire. They used to build um, uh, fires in, in the, the outside and cook their food. So they knew how to fry things. And the great thing about fish and chips was there was no stock that you had to buy. You bought fish, you bought your potatoes, you sold it, and the next day you had a bit more money and you could buy some more fish and chips for the next day's too. So it was a very easy way to build up business. But the Valvona crawler part is in that in um, 1890, Valvona did the same route from, he came from Atina, a bigger town further south from where we come from. And he had actually come into Edinburgh on one of the ships from Naples and had started trading in Italian produce for basically the Italians that were coming or people that knew Italy. And that was in 1890. So the 1934 connection came. Um, the Italian community had already gone through the First World War and Alfonso had fought in the First World War with my grandfather, so they'd all been called up. Almost as soon as they arrived, they were called up to fight with the Italians in the First World War and the British. Um, but after the First World War and they settled again, Valvona was getting into trouble with his business and my dear grandfather-in-law of Crowley decided that being able to sell mortadella and to slice salami and to take slices of cheese every day was a wonderful way to live. He made his choice and opened the deli with Valvona. It's been a great life. <laughs> Fantastic. But you mentioned that uh, Alfonso Crolla came up from Fontitune, which is uh, part of the municipality of Picinisco, which as we say that in the presentation at the beginning, it's a small town in the Lazio region, south of Rome. 
So there was a lot of immigration from Pichinisco to Scotland. And uh, <clears throat> including, for example, to mention another important name that resonates with a lot of people is the Forte family, the owners of the uh, Forte Hotels chain and the Balmoral Hotel in Edinburgh. And so how much it is important for you and for your family, for you and Philip, uh, the ancestral home and this link to Italy? I think um, it's an experience that as a child, um, I grew up on top of my father's ice cream and fish and chip shop, which was in Kennedy, sort of 10 miles east of Edinburgh. That's where the, their family settled. And as a child, we had lots of Scottish people. The Scottish people worked in the shop with us and we knew Scottish people. But we were the only people that were Italian. And we were the only people that had an ice cream and fish and chip shop. So from the age before I went to primary school, I already felt different, special, very happy because I had access to ice cream all the time. <laughs> so, you know, that, that was in, in big to us. And being of dual nationality, although we're not really dual nationality, because we're really, genetically, I feel Italian. I don't feel Scottish. I feel... Scottish in my upbringing, but I feel that I'm Italian. But the classic thing is when you go back to Italy, nobody thinks I'm Italian. They just think, you know, you're Scottish, you've got a Scottish accent, and don't try and kid us. Philip's got a very good um, accent because his father came across as an adult and he speaks very good Italian, but he can also speak Neapolitan. And that is the funniest experience because he, as a, a dual upbringing the same as me, goes to Italy. And people don't know he's Scottish, they think he's Neapolitan. And that gives him a great power because he can just get there and organise everything. Taxi drivers, there's no, way, there's no way we're not going to get good food in Italy. Whereas if I was on my own, it'd be more of a struggle. So I think the, the identity, to me, it's a gift. I've never struggled with it. Um, and also what happened to our families during the war, we didn't know about, it wasn't talked about as children, so our families in the Second World War were arrested because they were classed as aliens when the Italians became the enemy. And our families had a terrible tragedy through that. But as children growing up, although it was only 60, I was born 60 years after the end of the war, so it was a short time, but it was never discussed. So I had no feeling of guilt or feeling of fear, just had a, an idea that I was different. So. I think it just depends on the experience that, that you have. Of course. I think David has a question. David's muted. Sorry, I'm, I was David. muted. Sorry about that. Yeah. Can we, we just go back a little bit to Alfonso's story? And Alfonso, he tragically lost his life in 1940 in the uh, sinking of the Arandora Star, which was a converted cargo ship, I think, that was requisitioned later to carry troops and prisoners of war in World War II. Could you yes, tell us a little um, bit about that and what yes. happened and what that did to the course of the family life and business? Well, the, the, I don't know how many people know about the Arundel Star, but it was, um, it was actually a, a luxury liner that was uh, made into a cargo ship for the troops, a troop ship um, during the Second World War. Um, but was then used to transport what they called aliens um, from the from the UK to get aliens away. So this was the, the terrible June 1940 when um, Mussolini declared war. Overnight, the Italians became the enemy, although they were already established, had been working and living, and had children, you know, they'd been 40 years in the country and more. Um, but overnight they became aliens, and unfortunately, the the government decided that all the aliens would be a threat. And and then looking back, and I've done a lot of research when I was writing the books, especially Dear Olivia, where I tell the story. Um, it, just after Dunkirk, the the on the second of July, nineteen forty, the Arundora Star, was, well, the, the two days before, was filled with that the British government had arrested overnight. So what they did, and to my grandfather's house and to my uh, to Alfonso Cola's house, is the British government knocked on the door um, on the 10th of June 1940 and arrested all the male people between the ages of 16 
out of 70. And they actually took all the male people. So in Alfonso's family, Alfonso Crowley was arrested. And his two sons, Dominic and Victor Crowley, were arrested. And in my family, um, my grandfather, Chisidio de Chaco, was arrested. My father was arrested. And my uncle, Alec de Chaco, who was 15 years old, was arrested. And they were all taken. And the women didn't know who they were taken, but this happened across the whole country. And unfortunately, they, they were then taken to different holding points. And they, they just, it was almost like luck. But they thought that the older Italians were the ones who were more likely to be dangerous. And I don't know why, because there's pictures of Alfonso Cola uh, at that age, and he was very well fed, and he just had eaten too much salami. So it didn't look like he was going to cause much trouble. But um, in a list of, of people that they classed as aliens, uh, it was his, his age group that were put onto this ship. And then the sailed from Liverpool, and it had 1,500 people on board. And usually when it was a luxury liner, it had about 4,500 people. And on board were about 300 British soldiers, but there were also about 800 Italian aliens and German prisoners of war, German... Um, people like us that had, been, that had been living in Britain that were classed as aliens, and Jewish people, and some people that had come from uh, Germany to get solace, but they'd been also decided that they also decided that they were dangerous. And then unfortunately it was going across to Canada and it was torpedoed, torpedoed by a German U-boat. And in fact, yesterday we were, at, uh, we were doing a Zoom meeting with uh, the London um, Society of the Italians who are celebrating the 80th anniversary. And I didn't realize that it, it actually went down at 6.40 in the morning. And it went down within half an hour because the, the torpedo, the single torpedo just hit it and it was so heavy and unbalanced it went right. And the story of it going down is, is dreadful. But on that ship, um, we lost our phone call and we lost my grandfather as well. And you know, very moodily, um, a letter came to Philip, that's my husband, um, probably about a couple of years ago, from another Crowley who had been on the ship, and he was writing to my um, Alfonso's wife, and just saying that um, Alfonso and Chisidio were on the ship, and they were seeing their prayers together, and they sent their love. And that's all written in this letter, and you just think, it's just incredible. But what, what it meant for the women was that they were left without their menfolk. Um, the younger ones were put on the Isle of Man. I don't know how many of you know this, but they were interned on the uh, interned on the Isle of Man um, until after the war. So they had to survive through the war on their own. But actually, Italian women are pretty tough, and although they were grieving and distressed, they also knew that they had to survive, and they carried on with their businesses when they were allowed to, and they managed to survive and keep the business. But have any of you been to the Lomacrola and you'll see the outside of the shop is very unobtrusive, unobtrusive and it's got grey shutters at the front. These are the shutters that were put up on the 10th of June 1940 when all the windows were smashed. Um, and it's never been taken down. So in terms of our life's work as a family, one of the things we feel is that because our grandfathers, Philip and my grandfather, both died on that ship, we feel that we've got privilege to be able to still be in the UK and to have our lives here, and, but to be also bring our passion for what we've lost into the shop. So everything that we do all the time is about getting nice things to sell to customers, and you've no idea how fanatical we are about that. But we're always looking for new things, and we're always finding new people. Um, but we've also decided never to trade from another place in, in that deli form because it's lost. It's a, a vacation. So that's it. It's a great privilege. Very happy. What, what you mentioned, it's it's a very sad page in, in history and it will deserve just just uh, you know the whole time to, to talk about it. In the past year we had an event about uh, the Italian prisoners of, of war that uh, built up the the chapel in Orkney, the Italian chapel in Orkney. So in the, on that occasion, we talked also about that period. 
um, and, and what it meant for, for uh, Italians um, at the time. But anyway, let's, let's move to more cheerful times. Fast forward a few decades and Valvona and Crolla has become a temple of Italian uh, delicatessen, of Italian food and wines. So what does it mean? What, is, what does it mean to you to be considered an emblem of Italian identity or Italian Scottish identity in Scotland? I, I just think, I think we're, we feel very privileged that people trust us to find good food. Um, we're slightly um, critical of things that we don't like <laughs> because our palates, we, we taste all the time and we visit all the time. So our palates are very attuned. But it's really strange because we've I've got a grandchild now who's um, two grandchildren, but my little grandson Alfonso is being called after his great grandfather. But he has got such a passion for food and he's got such a refined palate that he actually he's only nine years old, but he will want to know, you know, where I got the meat for the sugo and what tomatoes I got and what on the boil. So I think Genetically in us, from having been years in the mountains, you know, the generations were surviving on being able to find good food from nothing. I, I don't know if it's in every Italian palate or in everybody that likes to eat palate, but I know that we are quite passionate about it. So it's a great privilege that people can enjoy what we enjoy, I suppose. Because if we'd been selling things that people don't like, they wouldn't want to come back. <laughs> I think as well, um, Sandra, I think that uh, I would say that the woman and the Italians have also changed the palate of the Scots. Because we've, got, we've been in, you know, most towns for the last 50, 60 years, I've had an Italian family trading in a chip shop or ice cream shop. And because that is such a personal relationship, when you go, you go back for your fish supper and the, the, who's ever serving you knows how you like it and all the rest of it. I think that also has been a, a conversation about food that's expanded with now pizzerias and Italian restaurants that are all over Scotland. But it's all run originally, a lot of them are run from that original immigration, which is quite incredible. But I think we've, we've nudged the Italians. I think they know good Italian, uh, the Scots know good Italian food as much as we do. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's interesting. You're at your shop, Mary, in Elm Row. I mean, it's a it's a wonderful location right in the centre of Edinburgh. And I know you've been, well, over the time, you, you welcome many generations of customers. And I think a lot of people are very, very loyal to, the, to your business. So how important is it to keep that connection with your customers and also your suppliers in Italy? Well, I think it's... It's just, it's a natural, it's a natural balance. It's because we're now, we're actually now fourth generation. My daughter, Francesca, is 42. And she's now running the, the business deep deep. And my younger daughter is working at the front and running the front shop. So I think that generation after generation means that there's a direct personal communication with customers from the family all the time. And there always has been. So that's as if, it's as if we're, our family is you and your family are us because we know our customers' children, we know their, you know, their grandchildren, we're sad when we lose a member of the family. So it could be that we see somebody every week or every day, or we see somebody who hasn't been into shop for three years and then comes back and says, oh, it's wonderful, it's not changed. And that's, that's the biggest compliment we can get if someone can come back and then we feel that the shop hasn't changed and it's, it's very powerful and it, one of the things we do when we talk to children when they come in and it's, it's something that a lot of people say that when they remember coming in as a child at the height of the shop and the aromas are quite imposing for a child so we say to them people come in and say I've not been to the as a baby and I'm just going to go down and kneel and look up and remember what it felt like because it's quite it's, it's, it's almost like a church it's almost like a so it's just a lucky the way the premises is. And also like every deli, every single shelf is free and every, everything is hanging and dripping and it's just, it's just fun. 
So our customers, they, they keep us right as well. And that's actually a, a wonderful thing that our customers, if something's not right or, or if they're not happy with something, they'll tell us personally. And, and you know, it's almost like they police the shop as well. The last thing we want is the shop not to be right. So we're all running the shop together. It's, it's, a, group, it's a group formula. <laughs> And what about your suppliers? Um, have, you, have you got long relationships? Uh, I know for some yes. parts, I think you have. I think the, the suppliers, I mean, the, the suppliers that we built up, originally Victor Cromer took over from Alfonso when he came back after the Second World War. He had to buy the London. So all his contacts with the Italian importers in London, they weren't allowed to buy direct. But when Philip and I took over, we were just very lucky joined the European Union and, and it was also the same time that the Slow Food started, Slow Food Organisation, if you know about that. So it was, it was the beginning of the renaissance of food in Italy and it was just a timing, especially for the wine, but Philip, um, he had a great sale when he took over and we sold off all the French wine that Uncle Victor had bought down in London and then he started to go to all the trade fairs and to go and meet the producers and built up the wine list probably about 40 years ago now, and actually he won a prize. He won the very first, very proud of this, he won the very first Italian wine merchant of the year for the whole of the UK uh, for the Decanter magazine. And that was just about four years after he'd taken over the shop, because what he wanted to do was meet every single producer and choose the wines that he liked and build up his list. And these are the people that we buy from now, but then we buy again all the time some of our suppliers will recommend other suppliers and we build up a, a formula like that. So it's great. And in the shop, it says continental produce. So we also buy from French producers, Spanish producers. So we've got, and actually from Scottish producers, I have to say, in all humility, <laughs> and from English producers. So the people that we buy from, sometimes we don't keep buying from them, but normally we've, we've kept that relationship up. So and I'll tell you something funny. When we went, when we knew that we were the European Union, and you know, please God, one day we can join again. But when we knew um, that we could bring in food direct for for fresh food, we started to get in touch with people that we knew and say, you know, could we have your cheese? Can we have your um, olive oil? So we built up and tasted the product, built the list that way. But the big thing was to get fresh vegetables to into the Scotland because you know it can't. Out Italian produce. We can't really cook if we've not got the proper San Marzano tomatoes. We don't have the scarola for our sugo. We don't have the proper peaches or the lemons from Amalfi. So Philip and I went probably about 35 years ago. We went to the Milan market with an agent that we knew. And the, the Milan market for vegetables is like um, the, the actual football pitches of Scotland times a million such a huge market and every huge um uh, what do you call it big uh, uh, shed is full of one product so they have one product that just one shed that just sells tomatoes one shed that just sells vegetables so it's a huge thing and we just didn't have a clue who we could buy from or how we could choose somebody to buy and Philip walked around walked around, walked around and then he had a Neapolitan accent and he looked and he saw a small a Neapolitan man his family selling a mixture of vegetables from a very, very small stand. And he, he, Philip said to him in Neapolitan, you know, Ciao, how are you? Where are you from? And they started to have a conversation. And those people are called Ancella, and we decided, he decided, you know, you're Neapolitan in the Milan market, we're Scottish Italians, we're going to buy work together. So that's who we buy from. And we phone, we phone that market every Monday morning and make our order, and we get wonderful vegetables and everything. So you know what's not to like. <laughs> Absolutely. Can can I just slip in one extra question, Mary, at this point? Um, Sarah has just asked, how did your business change with the availability of the many Italian products on the internet now, um, particularly wine? And and how has Brexit impacted? Well, Brexit in the first place impacted by raising the price of everything. And, and making it slightly more awkward, but because we knew different carriers, we've been able to, most of the time, find another route to bring things in. 
but it's definitely put prices up by about 15, 20 percent. But the other side of it is because the suppliers still want to get products here, and European suppliers want to sell to British Britain, they, the suppliers and the buyers are are making it work. It's not the politicians or the people at the borders that make it work. So so that's been difficult, but it's fine. Um, with the internet, I think. It's been the good thing about lockdown was a lot of people who would not normally have bought from us on the internet started to buy. So our internet site has actually expanded. And the fact that there's lots of other products elsewhere and similar products, um, what we do is we make sure that we can price match so we'll not sell something if we can't afford to sell it at the same price. But a lot of our products unique to us and from very small suppliers, and we've got deals with the suppliers that they don't supply anyone else. These are list cutting. But it's it's always competition's good. But I, I worked at the moment when I was a kid, when I was finished university and I was trained as a management trainee. I was one of the first female um, management trainees. And I was because I'd worked in a shop all my life, I was better than all the boys and they were really annoyed with me because I understood about trading and they'd, they'd come from university with big educations, but they didn't want to stack a shelf and lift a box. <laughs> um, what, what they did, I can't remember I was telling you that. Oh, yes, what they taught us was that if you, if you want to trade, trade near your opposition. You know, if you're going to open a store, open right beside your opposition because then the customer will enjoy the benefits of both and it keeps the standard high. So the internet's our great competition and we enjoy it. I'm not telling you that we're scared. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Of course. Mary, in the dedication page, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a similar question, actually, from what Sarah asked already. But in the dedication page uh, of your book, Dear Olivia, you talk about the legacy that, you know, previous generations of uh, your family left to you and your daughters. So a strong work ethics, uh, love for family, the importance of family, food and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and um, faith in God. So uh, how is it challenging or easy or natural to you by now uh, to conjugate, to merge both uh, the old tradition and the values and the necessity to, uh, you know, keep changing? Uh, I think, I think what, what, what I think there's, what I find really difficult and sad is that I didn't, you don't understand till you're older how difficult it is to communicate everything that you know with the younger generation. So I, I say things that I've learned or discovered or things that we know now or just experience and I, I don't even think I should tell the girls or my grandchildren because it's so obvious once you've learned that lesson, you know, once you learn that the is hot you don't have to tell people all the time so I think passing down the knowledge is really you have to make yourself do it and funny enough my father never taught Italian because of what happened in the war but he spoke Italian but he never spoke to us in Italian so that knowledge was lost and I can speak a little bit but not as I should so I think you have to I feel as an older person keep engaging with the young people and don't you know nag them or tell them all definitely listen to what they think and what they feel because I think it's difficult. And the other thing is our lives were really brought up in the Catholic Church with the routines of the Catholic Church and that has fallen away because of all the problems with the church and the way people live lives now. So that's a big problem because it was a structure for us which my children and grandchildren don't have in the same way. So what we do have is Sunday lunch and I'm the nonna, and I make sure that the cooking is good, and we always have Sunday lunch as much as we can, and that's the day that, as a family, with friends, we talk, and we make sure that we keep the conversations open, and, and that's, to me, it's the same as church, uh, in a different way. <laughs> but it was difficult, especially, you know, it's just different. And from when we were young, there was more control. Okay, so what are Mary and Philip's favourite food and wine? If is there something special that sort of 
transports you back to your Italian roots. Okay, so do you want to know what Philip's having for his dinner tonight? He's having fish and chips. <laughs> and do you know what I'm having as soon as we finish here? I'm having ice cream. So I eat ice cream every day of my life. I, my mother said to me, you'll never get fat eating ice cream, so I believed her. Um, but we, but I suppose one of the things that I brought to show you, I should have taken out the packet, is our phone sausage, which is the original sausage that, um, the original recipe that Alfonso Cola, Maria Cola brought from Fontefina. And it, we make it um, with the same spices, it's like our Coca-Cola secret spices. There's only Philip, Francesca and me know the recipe for the sausage. But the sausage makes the fugo. And the fugo is fantastic. So that's the one thing we eat every Sunday. It's spontaneous sausage fugo. Mary, sorry to interrupt you. May I just uh, ask you to be careful not to cover the microphone? All right, sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, now it's. Sorry, waving my phone to a sausage. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's, that's, that's fine. That's perfect. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> So we, we, we follow the seasons and we, I mean, most of the recipes that I put in here from Cheska are the recipes that I learned from my grandmother, from my mother, but, but mostly from my, my father's mother taught me. But the other person that I learned from was Philip's mother and she learned from Carlo's mother. So that Carlo's a Neapolitan and the Neapolitan cooking is so different from the, the, the cooking from Latvia. So those recipes, are richer and different, but I've written them all out. I'm not, but the ones that we use all the time are in Francesca. But one thing that I make frequently is pastina and brodo, or I'll make something. And I was I was making a pot of pastina the other day. In fact, I was making it for kids, the grandchildren because they weren't well. And as a good nonna, I made soup and I took it down in a pot. To them. And, and the wee one said, "Nonna, thank you. We love when you bring us free food." <laughs> <laughs> but the recipe that I took them was exactly the same recipe that my grandmother used to make. So that to me is wonderful that we can pass these recipes down. But actually it tastes lovely and it's healthy, so it's not as it's, it would be rubbish if my grandmother didn't have good recipes to start with. But of course I want also to remind everyone that uh, you have a lot of recipes available uh, in your website recipes that you have published in the past, but they're all available through your website as well. Yes, there's lots of recipes. And also on the Scotsman archive, the Herald, I do a recipe every week in the Herald. So you can get lots of recipes. If anybody wants recipes, then you just email the shop and we'll get it for you or photocopy it and send it. But I think with the other thing with, with the recipes is that, to me, you need to use good ingredients. So, you know, we can make a lovely recipe Really, if you've got really good olive oil and you've got really good tomatoes, then it makes all the difference. So with, with uh, Brexit, when we did the lockdown, there was a big panic because there were no tomatoes in the whole of the UK because the, 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 in, the imports stopped. But because it was coincided with Brexit, we had stopped selling tomatoes. So for about maybe five or six days in the UK, our only thing was the only place to get San Marzano tin tomatoes. And our phones were going hot. It was so beautiful all over the country. Please send us tomatoes. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. Well, you don't know, but before we open the doors, the virtual doors to everyone, Mary was showing me some fresh artichokes. And that's something that I really miss from Italy. And you just mentioned the pastina and broad. And that's another thing that it's typical Italian and you can find in your shop, but you don't find you know, anywhere else. Um, at least I'm not aware in other... I'll give, give the recipe for pastina because it's so easy to make and it's so cheap and, and everyone can make it because it's the most delicious soup. Exactly, yes. that, 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 That's amazing. Wonderful, but now I want to mention again what we were talking about at the very beginning, the honors that you received, because you received two honors. You were awarded an OBE in the Queen's Birthday Honors for services to uh, the Scottish food industry and Scottish-Italian relations. And you are also Cavaliere dell'Ordine della Stella della Solidarietà Italiana for your services to Italy and to Italians abroad. 
So how important was for you to receive these two honors from both countries? First of all, uh, it's a bit of a cliche to say, but I was very humble to receive both of them. Um, and it also shows my age because it, it shows, although I still feel like a 16 year old, it shows that I have actually lived a life. But I think the, the, the Cavalieri I was awarded for writing the story of the Arendora Star because at the time, it was still one of these stories that was not talked about. So it was about 25 years ago I wrote it. And we were, we were still frightened to write it because when the Italians were, you know, not, not everyone's best friends, I suppose you could say. So when the Italian government accepted and gave me the credit for writing that book, I felt very humble, but also very relieved that the Italians had accepted the Valdona Cruz story, our, our, our experiences, because it was a real experience. And I think the OBE also was given for part of that journey that I've had, of being able to keep talking about the Italian immigrant story and the fact that immigration can be positive and good. I have to confess, the most exciting honour I've had is uh, two years ago when uh, Philip and I got Italian passports. So we've got Italian citizenship now and British citizenship. And for me, that's more important than any honours because that means that we are accepted as citizens of both countries and accepted as uh, people in both the only thing I've got to do is learn Italian now, so that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that your Italian is fantastic, Mary. So have you got the OBE yet, Mary? Actually, I'm getting it, because because everything's been stopped, I'm, I'm getting it on the, 20, the 19th of January. Okay. I have to tell everybody, I've already got 12 dresses on the internet, come and send back. So I don't have my outfit yet, so it's a bit of a worry. <laughs> I think I'll just call it my apron. I look very smart in my, in my shop uniform. <laughs> <laughs> we'll look forward to seeing the photographs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not wearing a hat. <laughs> so, Christmas products that you have in the store, what are the special products that you keep and you would recommend to us? Well, everyone will have our panettone, which we've got our Canatonic is one of our suppliers that we found about 30 years ago, which is a small producer in Milan. And they make the Canatonic, and we have to buy it in July. You can order it, but we have to pay for it in July. So it's almost like a, a big investment. And this year, we're very proud to say that we've ordered 20 pallets of Canatonic. And when I first joined the shop, we used to sell all the different Mocha, Lamocha, and all the different brands of Canatonic. And everyone wanted one or another. We made a decision just to brand our own one and to make the recipe that we that we developed with the baker. So that's a product that everybody if they want that flavour, they have to get the kind of flavour. That's, that's wonderful. And the other thing that we love, and so you'll be very shocked to know that I'm not making homemade pasta because at Christmas all the the Nora's in my house always made homemade pasta and with maybe twenty or thirty eggs or forty eggs used to be a big conversation, how many eggs of pasta will we make? And I've given up on that and I use Campo Filoni egg pasta. Um, Campo Filoni is a town in the north of Italy and all these specialise in raspberry egg pasta. There's about 10 different factories make it and we've tested it all and this is one quite the best. So that's what we're having for Christmas Day. And we're having fun to lean at Google and catch up with <laughs> And chocolate, but I've left it by um, Rome, which is absolutely delicious, but I ate it before I came up to talk to you, so I can't show you that. And then we'll have things like panfati, and we've got lots of torone and lots of, lots of different chocolates because we buy more and more from different people. And then we've got the new team all about thriving because it's all got press now, and we have about 20 suppliers of all of them. So they're coming in, lots of people use that also for a Christmas gift. So there's lots to see. You never come into Bob and Crow and get bored. <laughs> no, absolutely. You, you are right. But what, what is the Contini family, um, Mary and Philip Contini, and you know your daughter's special Christmas 
Dime. So what, what we'll do is we always, we'll go to midnight mass after the talk and then we we'll go on and to one of our houses and we'll have smoked salmon and nibbles and things. But the next day, what we'll have for Christmas dinner is antipasto of everything. So we'll put big antipasto on the table. Then we'll have a big plate of uh, spaghetti with uh, the campo filone pasta, which is, I can't believe I'm telling you that I think it's all pasta. Sugo and a big, big asset, so a big Scottish asset, and we'll, we'll bring it in and we all cheer and, and laugh and joke. And then you won't believe this we'll have the meat out of the sugo, the, the, the pottini or the scale bone of the sugo, because I'll make a big pot of sugo. And then we'll have roast beef in your shop, <laughs> and then we'll have pasta and ice cream, and then we'll have cheese, and then we'll start again. So it's a bit, it's a very British Italian meal. We can still have the Scotland and Christmas <laughs> beef. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much. So looking to the future, so you've written lots of books on food and family history. What what does the future hold you? You're not working in the shop now. Francesca's taking over running the business. So uh, so what does Mary plan to do? Is it sort of a cosy retirement, or is that? Not on the horizon. Not on the horizon. So what, 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 to be honest, if we had been allowed to travel, we'd have been doing a lot more traveling to find more product for the shop. But I'm also writing another book called Dear Florence, which is uh, for my great, for my granddaughter. And it's, it's a book for my grandmother to her granddaughter to tell her some of the things that I've experienced and some of the things that I've learned, but also to shock her. Because I think every granddaughter needs to know that a grandmother is having one as well. <laughs> so that's going to be the title of that book. And then there's another couple of projects coming from the writing team. Um, and he's still doing his singing. He likes to do his singing. If, if you do more of that. Um, I also am on um, one of the trustees for a charity called Their Work, which if you're interested to look up. And it's a charity run by Sarah Brown, which is Gordon Brown's wife. And we've worked with the church at such a um, and what, what Sarah's done is, so over 25 years she's been running this, um, and basically what she shouts for is education for girls across the whole world, and especially in southern in, in refugee countries, and the fact that so many young girls, as soon as things go bad in a country, the girls are the first ones, we see it in Afghanistan, now, the girls are the first to lose a chance for education. And the charity just does everything it can to support children, and especially girls, to get an education. Because we all know that if you get an education, you get a chance to move on and become independent. So that's something that we're working on. Absolutely. We often forget that uh, <coughs> we're very privileged, but there is a substantial part of the world that uh, in which these things are not yet, uh, you know, an acquired right. So absolutely worthy cause. Um, well, uh, thank you very much, Mary. I, I would like now to open it really to to the floor and uh, see if uh, anyone in our, in our audience uh, want to ask a question or uh, make a comment. Uh, anyone? You should be able to unmute your microphones if you wish yes, to speak. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. A little bit of a problem in seeing, but uh, yes, I can see. Audrey says, absolutely delightful talk. Thank you very much, Audrey. Thank you very much. Yes, can I, sorry, yes. I'm, I'm going to unmute her here. Absolutely. Could you could you repeat the uh, charity that you were talking about? Yes. I've got it written down carefully as um, Unlock. Can you repeat it, please? Yes, it's called Their World. Can you see it? It's, it's there. You can see that. It's called the, Their World. That world. Their World. Thank their you. World. Because, thank you. I'll write that um, down. Their, their logo their is a lot big change. Because oh. what, they're, what they see is that if we can educate young children, a girls and boys, then their potential is unlocked. 
And actually, the promotion at the moment for global warming has been that um, if if we can educate a child, they might be the person that can solve the problem of global warming. You know, that they, they, all, the, all the, the goodness in people's uh, minds need to be released. One of the things when I was being educated as a child, a lot of the other Italians used to say to my father, don't educate your children because they'll leave you. And that was the fear that if you educate your children, they won't mm. want to stay in the family. Yeah, um, yeah. But then they realise that actually it doesn't just enriches the family. So Thank you. if you're interested, I can give you information and we can put something. Well, I would like to pass it on to some friends as well who would be very interested. Thank so you. thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. I'll I'll get in touch anyway with the yes, Aberdeen Italian Society. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. And there is another nice comment from Rachel Hannan. Let's say thank you for a most interesting talk. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anyone Want else? To talk to everybody. <laughs> to ask what you're having for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yes, please feel free. Um, yes, there is Susan says. Oh, Thank you again for a lovely evening. Please don't run away because we have still the surprise to play. Still surprise. <laughs> we still have a surprise to play. Well, if, if there are no other questions or comments, I would like really to thank Mary very, very much for being with us this evening. And, you know, I would just like to make a toast to Mary <laughs> and say, Buon Natale. Buon Natale, Mary, to, to you Cheers, and, to this is and to everyone. Uh, we are looking forward to seeing you again in 2022. And uh, before I close, I open my panettone and uh, I think that David can play your surprise now. Buon Natale e buon anno a tutti and uh, grazie Mary. <laughs> Porti cazzuna con no stemma retta, una cupolella che vi si è raizzata, passa scampagnana patuleta, con mano a papà te fa guarda, tu vuoi fare l'americano, americano, americano, sienta me che tu fa fa. Puoi vivere alla moda, ma si beve whisky and soda, o ti senti disturbato. Tu a ballo rock and roll, tu gioca a baseball, ma i soldi per camel, chi te li dà? La borsetta di mamma, tu vuoi fare l'americano, americano, americano, ma se nati in Italia, sienta me, non c'è sta niente a fa, ok, Napolitan, tu vuoi fare l'americano, Ballo rock and roll, tu giochi.